All right, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you happen to find yourself. Uh, my name is Brad Feeks with the Estes Group, and we have uh, commenced our webinar today on data center considerations. And I uh, want to thank you all, firstly, for attending. I uh, want to first to tell you a little bit about the Estes Group as a preliminary. Uh, so the Estes Group, we've been around for about 20 years, and our efforts have been focused primarily in the areas of manufacturing and distribution, and specifically in the blending of technology solutions to support those industries in helping customers to deploy their ERP systems, their ERP ecosystems entirely to those uh, to the primary cloud environments, uh, supporting their entire cloud ecosystem in the process in order to support kind of their growing business interests. And uh, in support of that, we've partnered for almost the last 10 years now with US Signal. And US Signal has been our data center provider, uh, providing the infrastructure under which we build all of our custom customer-based solutions in the ERP space. And so today, I'd like to bring in uh, my colleagues from US Signal to talk through some of the key considerations uh, when selecting a data center. Now, this is for us was a real big part of our own uh, strategic journey when we decided to build a build up a data center architecture underneath us and choose now how are we going to deploy our cloud solutions? Are we going to go with one of the big three? Are we going to try to buy our own server architecture? Are we going to try to co-locate? Uh, within another provider's uh, echo uh, data center footprint. Um, so we took these considerations really significantly and seriously at the time when we put this together, when we started uh, moving into cloud deployments. And we chose US Signal for a variety of reasons. And when we're talking with prospective customers, we find that those reasons are really important in differentiating the services and solutions we offer from some of our competitors. So. In that note, we thought it would be helpful to help uh, our customer base talk through some of the considerations you should be making when you are uh, coming up with a data center uh, selection. Um, so to do that, I've got two colleagues from US Signal today. Let me first introduce you to Jerry Clark. So Jerry Clark is the Director of Cloud Sales Deployment at US Signal. Uh, Jerry is focused on transforming the way that IT infrastructures are delivered and supported and in doing so helping customers get the full benefits of cloud computing. In terms of Jerry working with us, he, he helps us explain the contingencies and the competencies of US Signal's robust architecture to our prospects so that they can understand kind of what some of the capabilities and potentialities are there for them. Uh, joining Jerry is Chris Bullock. Chris Bullock is a cloud solution architect with US Signal. So Chris finds himself serving the roles as a solution engineer, architect, and manager, and helping cloud customers to understand the implications and the opportunities available at kind of the more detailed level um, with their prospective uh, cloud options. And in working with Estes specifically, he's, he's really good at tailoring specific customer-based solutions that match the, the precise needs of individual customers. Um, with that, I would like to turn this over to Jerry and Chris and let you guys take it from here. Appreciate that, Brad. I'm just gonna share out my screen here real quick and we'll get this party started. Here we go. All right, can everybody see the US Signal logo okay? Brad, you see that okay? Looks great. Excellent, excellent. Well, we did go ahead and put together a, a short agenda for everyone. It's really designed to optimize everyone's time here. And um, thanks, Brad, for all the introductions. So we're going to just start with just a quick overview of US Signal. We're going to dive into those key considerations that you're all here to find out about. Then we'll just take a, a few more minutes to talk a little bit more about how US Signal fits into those considerations. And lastly, we got a nice bonus for you, and that's a case study from one of Estes clients that you know, was having some challenges uh, and had a lot of decisions to make about where to host their Epicor application, stay on premise, go to the cloud. And we'll share that, that whole transformational process with you all. Real quick, a little bit about US Signal. There's a lot of information here. That's a picture of US Signal's headquarters. We're in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan. We've been around 21 years. We got around 350 employees. US Signal started out as a carrier and we still are. As you can see on the screen, we own a very large fiber network, spans into 10 states. 
We also own and operate eight data centers, <clears throat> and they're all strategically located in the upper Midwest. And according to FEMA, that is the safest spot in our country for data centers and cloud. Down in the bottom left there, you'll see all the compliances we carry. More importantly, though, right above the compliances in red, you'll see we're a VMware and Cisco certified cloud provider. And I have to tell you all, that is not easy to come by. We are literally audited six times a year, four for the compliances that we're mandated to go through. And then when you throw in the VMware and Cisco audits, we're under the microscope yearly six times. What that's done for us is give us the confidence to deliver a written 100% uptime guarantee on our cloud environment. And over here in the red, you'll see the number one thing that we hear from our customers why they chose US Signal is they all love being able to uh, pick up the phone at three in the morning or one in the afternoon and you're guaranteed to be speaking to an engineer in less than 60 seconds. Now try that with just one of the public cloud providers. Next, we are gonna talk about those key considerations and I wanna hand this over to, to Chris. He's gonna take you through this comprehensive list. Yeah, thanks Jerry. Uh, so we have a lot of conversations with a lot of folks, and uh, when you're looking at a data center provider somewhere to host your critical infrastructure, your, uh, your you know, primary tier one applications, that sort of thing, uh, really there's a lot of considerations from the physical location to logically where they're located, how you access them, and then also ob the obvious security considerations, both physical and logical security. Uh, and that's where U.S. Signal has really focused our efforts over the years from the very early days back in our history when we were just doing data centers for our own backbone network to now offering data center co-location and cloud hosting and, you know, enterprise level cloud disaster recovery, all of those things falling under the umbrella of data center and our network connectivity. So from a location perspective, you're looking at geographically, where is that data center located? The considerations there, you're typically in almost all cases are gonna be looking for the most separation you can get from a disaster recovery perspective if it's only for a DR separation, but still maintaining low latency. From a production standpoint, if you're moving uh, your production workloads to a cloud environment, uh, latency is definitely a consideration. So that geographic uh, distance from wherever your workers are, the users of your environment, that's gonna play a big part in what that latency is. The other big part of that is how that data center is connected. So there's a lot of, uh, like I heard Brad mention earlier, the, the big three and some of the other data centers that are out there, they have various different methods of connectivity, how they get to their users, whether that's a, you know, buying internet access from other providers uh, or having connectivity maybe between their data centers that they purchase from somewhere else. And that's a big consideration when especially you're talking about moving your production workloads in there, as well as possibly your backup and disaster recovery replication based workloads. If those are going in two different data centers, where are they located and how are they connected? So your production access, that location is going to be critical to the user experience. So having a low latency connection, what is the most optimum network data path to get to those production workloads? And then you still want to have a level of low latency and, and easy access to that disaster recovery data center as well for those backups and those DR uh, replicated workloads, but you want them farther enough, far enough away to get out of the way of a natural disaster or you know, widespread power outage, that kind of thing. So, and then all of that also goes into the air gapping, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, but you get into the physical air gapping, which is that geographic separation, but also the logical air gapping, which is more along the security bullet points that you see here. So underneath the security umbrella, you've got your basic cybersecurity stuff, right? Let's well, say basic because it, we can talk about it for days, actually, with all the depth of each one of those uh, different facets of cybersecurity. But with a data center provider specifically, you're mostly looking at edge security. Uh, so if you're considering where to put those workloads, how the network is connected to that particular data center, what are the edge security? Do they have IDS IPS? Do they have a zero trust environment? What are the capabilities to keep bad actors out uh, of your production environment or even your disaster recovery environment? But also the physical security stopping people from actually getting access, physical access to your data, not letting somebody walk through the front door. Uh, that's where things like biometric entry, uh, you know, biometric uh, physical door, man traps, I mean, all the things that go into the physical barriers to keep a data center physically secure. 
Uh, we avoid using things like access cards. A lot of people use access key cards. Those key cards can be passed from person to person. Hey, Joe, you're going to go do some work at the data center, even though you've never been checked out or, you know, passed any security background checks. Here's my card. You can go ahead and get in. That's why we avoid those and use biometric entry systems to uh, basically make sure we know exactly who is entering and who is leaving uh, to have good accountability for the physical uh, access to that data center, whether that's that could be an on-prem data center, could be a cloud-based data center, co-location, whatever the case may be. U.S. Signal takes all that in, into account because we have customers' production workloads in there, and we have to protect them just as much as we protect our own. Uh, network security goes hand-in-hand -hand with the cybersecurity piece. So how are those users accessing the data center? How are they getting in? Is it via an IPsec VPN, maybe a direct fiber connection? Uh, we do all of the above. So we take very careful care to make sure we have that network securely, but also very high performance. So you have that low latency access capability built into it. And finally, the financial security piece, it's something a lot of folks may not consider when they're looking at a data center provider. We talk about uh, TIA 942 certifications and uptime and tier level ratings and things. Uh, the other side of that consideration is, will that data center provider be around in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years? Uh, and that's where the financial security piece really plays into it. Are they a solid company with a solid background who has a proven track record of financial stability, and they're going to be able to maintain their operations without going, in plain and simple, without going out of business. They're, they're going to be there for you as long as you need them to be there. Uh, and that's another very large consideration when you're looking at where to put your production workloads, your disaster recovery. Uh, Jerry and I, and even work with Estes, we've had several situations where customers have come to us in basically a panic because their data center provider that they were in where they had their own hardware or maybe they were doing cloud hosting uh they went out of business they had to go bankrupt or they got bought out or they were selling the building or whatever the case may be um and so the financial security the financial stability of your provider should be a major concern to make sure you know they're going to reliably be there for as long as you need them and then finally, we move on to compliance. Uh, so what kind of audits, what kind of uh, certifications does that data center have? If you're a financial-based customer uh, and you're a financial-based company and you have a credit card processing, so you need PCI compliance, your financial base, maybe you need SOC compliance, or you do anything related to healthcare insurance companies, you need HIPAA. Uh, obviously, we've got GDPR for European citizen data. We also deal a lot with municipalities and governments. So we have police departments, which fall under the CGIS or criminal justice. So we have those that we have NIST as well. We have some ITAR stuff for Department of Defense. So a little bit of everything. You want to make sure that those compliance and those audits are available. So not only does US Signal or does your data center provider have proof that they've gone through those audits, but that information is available in case you get audited. So if you go through your audit, you can say, here's my data center information, here's all the compliances that they fall under, and you've got all those boxes checked for whatever audits that you have to complete to make sure you're satisfying your business rules for your, uh, for your company. Uh, so that's something US Signal, obviously, we have a whole security and operations center team that does exactly that. Uh, we, like Jerry mentioned before, we have multiple audits every year uh, because of all the different compliances we carry and the different types of regulatory data that we carry, uh, as well as being Cisco certified and VMware certified. So those are additional more technology and stability based audits. Uh, but we, you know, that's a, a regular thing. So something also to keep an eye out for whatever happens to fit your business. But we have found that even non-compliant businesses, so uh, you have a, a basic company, you know, they're just doing maybe some uh, you know, basic manufacturing with nothing that falls under HIPAA or PCI or SOC. They don't really need any type of compliance, uh, but they want to know that their data center is compliant because it shows that that data center has gone through all of the work. And if they qualify for that level of certification, then you know they're secure. They're checking all those boxes for physical security, for redundancy and resiliency and uh, cybersecurity and edge and all that sort of thing. So it's just a, it's a very good thing to, to know that they went through the audit and passed the audit and can prove it uh, because that tells you that they've uh, done all the work and you can rely on that infrastructure to be secure uh, and, and resilient for you. And then finally, the uptime guarantee, that falls a lot into the, a lot of those checkboxes. Uh, they're going to be up and running when you need them. So do they have any history of outages? What type of power redundancy do they have? And of course, the infrastructure that you're running on is only good if you can access it. So what type of network redundancy and resiliency do they have? Um, look at their track record over the years uh, for any type of issues that they've experienced. Are they on multiple power grids? Uh, do they have you know, multiple network entrances, fiber dedicated to that facility, that sort of thing? Uh, and another actual real basic consideration is, do they buy their access from somewhere else, 
or is it under their control? Uh, that's one of the big things U.S. Signal has built our success on, as we call ourselves the network powered cloud. Because as you saw earlier in that slide, Jerry mentioned, we have 14,000, a little over 14,000 uh, route miles of fiber that is our own fiber on our own backbone. And our data centers are placed strategically on that fiber backbone for that very reason. We don't have to buy the access between our data centers or even for that matter to reach out to our customers. We don't have to buy that from anybody else. It's all under our control. Uh, so that's something that's a big advantage to us because it brings that uh, that, that kind of cohesive, holistic solution uh, into one area. So if you guys are having trouble accessing your data center, you know the one person to call. You know the one person to contact. They can look at power. They can look at uh, network access, edge security, all those things, and figure out what the problem is and get it resolved very, very quickly. Um, just a heads up, Jerry, you're still sharing your screen uh, with some with some uh, IM and chat information. So I just want to give you a heads up. Um, and then finally, on the support piece of it, uh, we've got, uh, from U.S. Signal and SE's perspective, we work very closely together on both pre-sale and post-sale information. So we help, and this is one of my primary uh, duties, is to help design that custom application or that custom solution, I should say, just like Brad mentioned, uh, from an architecture and solution design perspective. Uh, that's something that we have a very deep bench full of guys just like me that do that very thing. Uh, and then also post-sale, the 24-7, 365 support in our technical operations center and the SDS team partnering with us and our security operations desk. And we have a whole separate thing behind the scenes called our surveillance department. They're watching the backbone network and making sure everything, those 14,000 miles of fiber and all the data centers and power and, you know, the security and cameras everywhere, they're watching over all that information to make sure that everything is staying up and running, catching things before they become critical, uh, recognizing, again, when you have that much fiber, there might be a fiber cut or, you know, an, an outage somewhere um, and make sure that all the protection mechanisms are working correctly. So we have a whole surveillance department that's 24-7, 365 dedicated to just doing that. And that just goes into that post-sale support. So you know that going forward, uh, you're going to have the access to the people that you need to get a hold of if you have a question or an issue, uh, that they're, they're going to be available 24-7, 365, and they can actually fix the issue kind of regardless of what that issue is. Uh, again, whether that's physical access, network access, just performance-based. So uh, that's something that SES and, and, and us have partnered together over the years to have that holistic solution and that holistic support mechanism built into it as well. So with that, I'll hand it back to Jerry, and we can uh, get into more, some more specifics. Sounds good, Chris. Appreciate that. Like I said, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the U.S. Signal story, and this slide really speaks to what Chris was talking about and what I was talking about a few minutes ago about, you know, the location of your data center matters. And as you can see, there's four pretty good reasons to choose a data center in the upper Midwest of our country. We don't get earthquakes up here. We're not about to get pounded by hurricanes. Very low tornado risk area, unlike Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas. We know all the big boys, they traverse across that lower Midwest. You know, I mentioned FEMA. FEMA has actually deemed Michigan to be the second best state next to Alaska for data centers and cloud, not only because of the four reasons here, one other, <clears throat> and most people don't know this, but Michigan is split right down the middle between an East and a West power grid. So we're able to offer that geo diversity that pretty much every business on the planet seems to be looking for nowadays. Uh, just as, this is our 100 gig backbone fiber network that you see there on the screen. And as Chris was talking earlier about the key considerations, um, location, latency, big concerns, this fiber network has, plays a big role in our cloud program in a lot of ways. What we've been able to do through 21 years now is peer, and when I say peer, I mean physically connect with just about every ISP, internet service provider in the country. You can see in red there, we're, we're connected with over a hundred of the tier one ISPs in the country. So what that translates to from a cloud perspective is low national latency. No matter where a business is located in the country from their office, which is their originating ISP, they're a couple hops away, puts them right on our hundred gig fiber network and carries them into their private cloud environment that Estes is managing for them. Let me give you an example. From San Diego to US Signal is only 39 milliseconds. <clears throat> now, I don't want to get too technical, but I can tell you that is extremely fast com considering the distance. The reason is because of our peering partners, the ISPs, shortening the hops. So we've had a lot of enterprise clients actually check the latency, and they've called me up. They've literally 
called me after a presentation like this and said, Jared, we just did five tests around the country and we're shocked. You guys are faster than the public clouds. And they all scratch their head going, wait a minute, how is that possible? And I remind them, we're all human. We only retain 10% of what we hear the first time. It's just the way we're built. So I just bring them back to three critical things. One, it's our fiber network. Two, our peering partners we're connected with. And three, it shortens the hops. So they're like, okay, you're right. You told us we're in. Now, this is a map of where the data centers are. And as you can see, all of our data centers are literally sitting directly on the fiber network. We've done that on purpose for resiliency and DR purposes. And notice the five upstream internet providers. Again, all of that factors back into that 100% SLA that we were talking about earlier, always on infrastructure, always on internet. And over here in the red, this is how we deliver our cloud services to our customers and partners. We provide them a VMware login so they can log into an environment 99% of IT people are very familiar with, which is VMware. We provision the CPU, the RAM, the storage, the bandwidth, and then we let our partners and customers build their servers their way. We don't have these pre-built instances and templates like Amazon and Microsoft do and kind of force feed you into that model. We've had a lot of customers and partners tell us it feels like they're you know, trying to stick a square peg in a round hole sometimes. The instances just don't line up right. So we give, we provision the exact amount of CPU, RAM and storage that you're gonna need. And we let you build your servers again, your way. Now we're constantly getting asked, what makes US Signal different? And honestly, this is a short list and I'm not gonna go through every single bullet point, but the ones in red <clears throat> are the ones that our partners and customers have actually told us what made their decision to come to US Signal. Uh, we talked about support earlier, one of the key considerations. <clears throat> Everybody who's a customer of US Signal loves the fact that they can speak to an engineer in the middle of the night or the middle of the afternoon in 60 seconds. And I think we all agree that when you're in trouble, you need some help or advice, you wanna to speak to somebody quickly. We talked about the low national latency and I think we'll all agree that everybody who's using a cloud service wants a high speed on-ramp to their cloud environment. Number three, we have no egress fees. And what that is, if you're not familiar, um, it's the public cloud providers, they charge for data in and out, mostly out, it's called the egress fee. So you, all, you, you may get an unpredictable bill. Well, let's put it this way. You get a bill every month for the downloads and uploads that your users have done the previous month. And I like to call it unpredictable because you never know what that cost is gonna be. If you do a lot of downloads, you could have a very surprised, you know, su very uh, surprising bill show up. Um, you know, I mentioned the fiber between our data centers plays a very big role in our cloud program in a lot of ways, not just because of our peering partners. I'm gonna show you a diagram here. And again, I don't wanna to get too technical, but this is a top level view of what our infrastructure looks like for every single customer. Every customer has access to two data centers, a production data center and a backup and maybe even replication data center. They're geodiverse. We talked about that earlier. So they're literally sitting on an East and a West power grid. But here's the really cool part at US Signal. We include for free high-speed fiber connecting the data centers. And what's that for? What's the purpose of that? Well, backup traffic, maybe any other type of traffic that's going between the data centers. It preserves the internet service for all the end users. And we provide that high-speed fiber connection between the data centers for that traffic. It's very unique. If you look around, I mean, I, I can probably say confidently, there's not a cloud provider in the world that's bringing this level of sophistication to a business with dual data centers, geodiversity, and then for free, a point-to-point -point fiber circuit that connects the data centers. Over here on the left, that single pane of glass, that's VMware. So when you or somebody on your team's logging in, you're controlling both data centers. And that's what SD's team loves. They like to control not only the production data center, but the backup and DR site. Like they're managing your recovery points, your recovery times, they're documenting all that for you. We also provision a dedicated firewall and an internet service coming directly into that firewall. The firewall is a Palo Alto top of the line security appliance and it comes with unlimited VPNs. So again, if you, if you think about these two things right here in the center and compare that to what we're doing at US Signal as a private cloud provider, compared to the big three public clouds. The public cloud providers, they're sharing, they're aggregating their internet, their firewalls between hundreds, if not thousands of customers. 
Everything at U.S. Signal, as you can see, is private, segmented, and in my opinion, much more secure. Now, data protection is obviously a big consideration. Doesn't matter how resilient your production data center is, you need to back up your information offsite. So we offer uh, a whole suite of backup and replication solutions. So keep that in mind if you're partnering with a data center, another cloud provider, you wanna make sure that they have these solutions available. SD's group is very proficient on our tools. So they're using our backup solution. They're using our replication solution between the data centers. So you're in good hands there. And here I'd like to add a little bit more yeah, 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 to that ahead. slide actually. We touched on that earlier with the, um, the data protection and having that geographic segregation. So you've got that separation between your production environment and your disaster recovery environment. So with that, there's a latency concern there as well. You wanna have the maximum performance, but the most separation you can have. So there's two different considerations for separation between your production and your disaster recovery or backup environment. And that's gonna be a, a geographic separation for more natural disasters, act of God, you know, large weather power outages, that kind of thing. Uh, but also then a logical separation. And you'll hear the term air gapping a lot. And that's what US Signal has built into this. You'll saw, you saw earlier when Jerry was showing the, the two data centers connected by the US Signal backbone, that's the advantages that we can provide to make that low latency connection between your production and your disaster recovery data center and give those two with replication between them at a very low latency, high access rate. But at the same time, things like DRAS, like you see in the lower right-hand corner of the screen right now, that provides that air gapping, that logical and physical air gapping, because it's got control plane separation, it's air gap from the production, uh, it's real-time replication. So you have very low recovery point objectives, very fast recovery time objectives, very little data loss, come back up very quickly, and it has that logical air gap. So bad actors aren't really going to even see that it's being replicated by DRAS. It's not an operating system in the other DR data center that can be like infected on its own. Uh, so we, there's a several different solutions there too. Even with our backup as a service, we have uh, levels of immutability and that capability to have that control plane separation to make sure your backup and your disaster recovery, it has that logical separation. So it's secure and reliable and there for when you need to recover from something bad that happens. Uh, so that plays into that physical security, or for, I'm sorry, physical diversity, as well as that logical air gapping between the data centers. And that's where US Signal can really leverage some of those replication-based managed services over a dedicated data path between the data centers that runs on our own fiber. So keeping everything very secure and very single tenant. So very enterprise level, private cloud-ish. But sorry, Jerry, thanks for, for letting me chime in there. No, that's good stuff, Chris. Um, remote monitoring management, most, IT service providers like Estes do this for their customers. We do have some solutions that we roll out for some of our larger enterprise clients as well, but Estes is, that's their main forte, as well as Epicor is doing managed services. Um, we offer a data transfer service that's for large amounts of data that potentially are moving into the cloud. Um, you can usually upload that through the internet, but if bandwidth is a concern, we offer the data transfer service. And what that is, is where you can ship us a drive, like a USB drive or a NAS device, um, stick it in the mail, ship it overnight, um, and then we seed your data. So it just gets your cloud environment seeded much quicker. We also offer migration services. So we have a full team of professional engineers, uh, and that's what they do pretty much all day long, is they, they migrate servers and they lift them up and drop them into US Signal in their as-is state. Um, so if that's something that a lot of people consider when they, they're doing a move, just to move their, their servers, they may have an updated operating system, so they don't need to rebuild it. Um, so you have a lot of choices. You can start from fresh. When you come to the cloud, you can build your servers with a brand new operating system, reinstall the applications and move the data, or we can lift them up in their as-is state and move them right in. And that's really everything I have from a U.S. Signal perspective. And now I wanted to remind everyone that we have a nice bonus here at the end of the case study. And as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, an Estes customer that they had identified. They had some Epicor challenges or, and I'm gonna just kind of pass it over to Brad. Maybe he can kind of set the stage. And then we're gonna bring up a kind of a, a, a drawing here for Chris to fill in some of the solution side. So go ahead, Brad, if you wanna set the stage. 
Sure, sure. I'll, I'll give the, the English version and then let uh, Chris interpret the rest. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about a customer of ours. They had came to us, they had found us uh, over the internet and had reached out to us and, and we uh, connected with them pretty quickly and found uh, our way to a solution pretty quickly with them. And in terms of our customers, now we primarily host customers enterprise resource planning or ERP systems. And we have kind of two basic types of customers that come to us. Uh, one type is generally of the, I need you to manage the system for me. And those are folks who are, are quite often, they're losing their IT managers. Uh, people are retiring and they're having a hard time replacing them. So they'll come to us looking for more of a platform as a service or an entire bundled solution where we do all the, the low and high level management of the application and all its layers other, underneath that. Now, now, other customers, they come to us, they might have very strong IT uh, departments internally and a good staff, and they're not necessarily looking to outsource so much as they're like looking to take things that are non-essential to the business and move them to the side. So this customer, they came to us and they said basically, well, we're, we're looking to move from managing the blinking lights to supporting the needs of the business. So it was kind of a paradigm shift for them, basically. And they came to us then looking to try and break out that hardware component that they had been using to support their enterprise resource planning system and their entire ecosystem, because uh, an ERP is always connected with plenty of third party applications, extensions, integrations, some of these are part of the ecosystem and installed locally. Some of these are communicating over the firewall. Uh, some are, are working at one of various levels from the database level all the way to the web APIs. And so they came to us looking to help uh, offload that entire ecosystem uh, to us. Um, so we came up with what we call an infrastructure as a service plan in which we stood up the architecture, worked with them on integrations, worked with their vendors, kind of brought in a whole team of people to integrate and build out that ecosystem. And thereafter, kind of handed the keys back over to them because they were of the type where they they uh, don't only want to make sure that's working, they like to get in and be able to see what's happening. They want to get on the app server and, and see where app server performance is. They want to be on the database server and be checking to make sure that their indexes aren't fragmented or what have you. And we brought uh, US Signal in at the onset of that conversation to try and help understand what kind of solution they might need and how we might best flush that out. And to that end, Chris, why don't I hand it off to you to kind of speak to some of that uh, kind of lower level architecture. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, so what you see here is very similar to what Jerry was talking about earlier. You've got a data center on the left-hand side, that's their production data center. And then you've got another data center, geographically diverse. So over in Detroit, in this case, it's Grand Rapids and then Detroit, Michigan. Uh, so that gives them that geographic diversity between their production environment, which is in Grand Rapids and their disaster recovery environment and also where their backups are over in Detroit. So it creates that, uh, that geographic separation. So you're not gonna be affected by a power issue, a widespread power issue, or you know, any kind of uh, mother nature activities and that sort of thing. So they know that if there's a, a catastrophic event in Grand Rapids, they can recover into Detroit uh, without really any issue and very low uh, recovery time. So that's the, the beauty of the draft. So with this solution, uh, this show, it's a very good example to show how the customer has the Palo Alto security with the internet, and this is riding that internet backbone that you saw Jerry talking about earlier with all those transit upstream peering. So not only do they get an internet port from US Signal, when they get that internet port, this goes into our backbone. So this is a huge backbone uh, all on the public IT side of US Signal's fiber network with all those transit peers in various different areas. So we're not reliant on any one kind of on-ramp into the overall internet. We have multiple. In fact, we have several 100 gig, 10 gig ports out of Chicago and Indianapolis and Detroit and all over the place. So you're getting the advantage of that entire public backbone by simply getting that one internet port via US Signal into your cloud environment. Then you have the world-class Palo Alto front-end security. So that's that edge security piece for those customer workloads specifically. So single tenant, virtual, uh, by nature of the infrastructure, it's highly available as well. So it sits in our security clusters. It's protected by redundant infrastructure. So that's how we do that 100% uptime guarantee, just like Jerry was talking about earlier, uh, for the access to the cloud as well as the actual cloud environment itself. Then here is that single tenant. We call it a resource pool. You'll see flexible resource pool down there at the bottom. 
Uh, that is that single tenant enterprise cloud uh, for this particular end customer. And within that, you will see they not only have some, you know, they have all these VMs hosted under a private RFC 1918 uh, type of uh, private network, but you'll see that red box uh, that's located right here. That red box represents the critical tier one servers that are protected with the disaster recovery. So with that real-time replication, and you'll see that replication going over here to Detroit where it lands in what we call a VPG or virtual protection group. And that's riding that 10 gig backbone that Jerry talked about. That's that connectivity between the data centers. And that's all free. We don't charge anything for the connectivity between the US signal data centers. And this is uh, redundant. There's probably four different data paths that are used to get between the Grand Rapids data center and the Detroit data center. So multiple levels of redundancy built into that fiber backbone as well. And that data replication is obviously very fast because you're running at 10 gigabits per second on a 100 gig backbone. So you've got great bandwidth access between your data centers. You can also use that to access a secondary domain controller that sits in what we call a pilot light pool, again, over there in Detroit as an active secondary domain controller. So it can back up your primary sitting in the production facility. It can take over very quickly in the event of a catastrophic disaster where you fail over into the DR environment. And then really that network connectivity and the disaster recovery coupled with it is kind of the magic sauce for having that uh, that resiliency built in or the redundancy built in and that quick failover with U.S. signal managing the firewall and the network and the backbone and the replication because you have that control plane separation. You've got somebody doing it that's outside of your organization. So it's not subject to, you know, maybe uh, if you have a bad actor get into your domain or, you know, somebody opens up an attachment they weren't supposed to that got through your security somehow. Uh, you've got U.S. signal managing that to where we have a separate control plane and access to manage your, your failover, your disaster recovery event. And with that comes the real-time replication of your firewall as well. So if you have something very bad happen uh, and this Grand Rapids site is completely offline, whether that's a ransomware type attack, uh, you know, a large physical disaster in the area, you have a complete carbon copy of your entire environment, compute, memory, storage, firewall, network, access, everything over in Detroit. That means kind of, the, again, the magic sauce when you put all this together is you have a production environment that's available all the time. You've got a disaster recovery environment that's available at a moment's notice. And if you do have to declare a disaster, you don't have to change any DNS. There's no IP changes, internal or external. So you have the same public IPs, the same private IPs when the VMs fail over. All your firewall rules come up immediately because we're protecting that firewall with the same level of protection that we're protecting the virtual machines as. This for this particular end customer was really the final solution that brought it all together for them. They had a hosting solution for their ERP. They had management control via vCloud director so they could get access to those servers. They could manage those servers, but still with SD's help whenever is needed so they have access to that environment. With real-time replication to a DR environment, that stays logically and physically air gapped from the production with a high speed backbone for not only access, but also disaster recovery and backup. So it brought all those things together and really utilized a lot of those uh, advantage elements from US Signal and the power that SDS brings into helping us come up with these designs for ERP systems and P21 and that sort of thing. So it really came together and worked out really well. Very good. Very good. Now, um, as we start to wrap up here, I start to see some questions flowing in. So if you have any questions about this specific case study or questions in general, we can definitely feel those as they come through. Uh, let me ask you one here. I had one come through. Got a customer saying, my provider that I'm looking at, they are co-located. So given that the servers in question would be in a data center either way, why is private cloud better than a co-location? And I, I can take that, Jerry, if you like. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, Thanks. yep. We, we run into that quite a bit, actually. So this goes back to a couple of different points we had earlier when we were talking about the key factors in a data center. Um, one of the first things I would consider if I've got some, whether you're going to maybe an MSP that has a co-located uh, offering of the realm, they say, hey, we'll host your stuff on our equipment or bring your stuff into our you know, co-located data center. At that point, they're dependent on another data center provider. So they're kind of just that person in the middle. Uh, so this speaks a lot to what do they have for network connectivity? What are their interlinks? So do they have transit peering? What kind of network access do they have? Is it redundant? Is it protected? Is it fast enough? Are they aggregating that maybe with a bunch of their other users to cut down on costs, things like that? 
then it also gets into, this would be probably one of the first concerns that I would have, is to the financial stability. If they're co-locating in someone else's data center, are they financially stable, financially secure? They're going to be around. They're a stable company. They're not going to get bought out, disconnected, shut down, because they're also going to be dependent on that overall data center provider to be stable and make sure that they are providing the services to that MSP so they can provide services to you, for instance. Um, just to put that in perspective, uh, we are a co-location data center provider. We have a lot of folks out there. We have MSPs that build their own um, cloud offering uh, in co-location in our data centers. Now, they have, and I'll you know, kind of toot the U.S. signal horn here, they have the great advantage of being in a U.S. signal data center, so we're not going anywhere, so they feel secure, but it's just another person in the middle, so that MSP you know, if they don't plan correctly or they don't buy the correct services, they don't do their capacity planning correctly, all those things, they have to then buy more equipment and they have to add more equipment to their environment. U.S. Signal, we have performance engineers and capacity planning engineers and all that in this very large clustered host environment. We own the data center. We own the interconnects. We have all the power. We manage all the power, all ourselves. So it's a completely holistic solution. And there was an old saying back in the day about, you know, they want one throat to choke. We, uh, we like to change that to one back to pat uh, because we can get these things fixed very quickly. We, uh, we have access and visibility to all of it. So all of the building controls, all of the network up down protection mechanisms, all that stuff. So we can provide that level of access and level, level of support, honestly. Excellent. And how does that, um... How does that overlap with like hardware refresh cycles? I know that's uh, some customers ask us about that, what that looks like. And I'm assuming that that might be a challenge for a co-locator versus U.S. signal. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I believe I you. You're Chris, on mute, Chris. I think you've muted yourself, Chris. Yep, I had a, a my my network changed windows and I got muted. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question. Honestly, it's uh, it, it's something that we have designed from day one with our cloud products because we have a very large clustered host environment, like I mentioned previously. So this is a large environment that has many. By the way, it's all Cisco UCS chassis, UCS blades with SAN storage. I mean, this is all enterprise grade hardware that we're using. And we are able to do rolling upgrades. So when we have uh, maintenance windows scheduled to maybe upgrade to the next version of VMware or Cloud Director, or we have infrastructure augments that we're doing. So these are all Cisco UCS enterprise chassis. We need to add additional blades to the cluster, things like that. We can do those in a rolling fashion that doesn't take down the customer. So we, we have spare at all times, we have spare blades, spare equipment. We can move workloads that are, by the way, you know, we, it doesn't affect the, the uh, end customer. So the VMs stay up and running. There's things called vMotion, and there's other types of, uh, of uh, fancy moving around of workloads you can do within a VMware environment and ESXi in general. We will move those virtual machines over to blades and then vacate the blades that need to be upgraded. Do the upgrades in, in, a, in a rolling fashion. Then once those are upgraded, move the, move the VMs over to these blades that have been and kind of slowly work your way through until you've gotten all the way through that cluster or the multiple clusters and no virtual machines were taken down. So one of the big advantages with that, and again, this goes back to the 100% uptime SLA guarantee that US Signal provides with our cloud. This is a huge advantage to anybody that is in the current situation of managing their own infrastructure. Because when you manage your own infrastructure, you have your own data center, whether it's on-prem or maybe in someone else's data center in a co-location, you have maintenance windows, you have break fix, you have to go out to these things in the middle of the night and plan out when you're, you know, maybe you're getting age storage, you're getting old compute and memory, you got to swap out some equipment. Or, you know, maybe you have a break fix situation, you have a drive that went bad in your SAN or, you know, a memory dim that went bad in your compute environment, whatever the case may be, you've got to get out there, schedule these maintenances, be there in the middle of the night. Those are outage times. A lot of times the infrastructure has to be taken down to do those repairs. All of that goes away. You no longer have to worry about infrastructure maintenance windows or doing upgrades or augments to your infrastructure. You don't have to worry about hard drives breaking or having to replace or, or, or refresh the hardware. U.S. Signal takes care of all of that. And uh, the, the beauty of that thing is we do it without taking the infrastructure down because of the size and the way we have those rolling updates done in our larger clustered host environments. Uh, there, are, there are maintenance windows that don't have any service effect. So we're obviously very careful. We notify people if there's any major changes being made, uh, but those changes 
don't affect the customer operations. So even in the middle of the night, when we're doing them in a safe maintenance window, um, the VMs are not taken down. So that's that's a big consideration uh, when you're looking at moving from an on-prem on infrastructure to something like an infrastructure as a service, like this case study we looked at just recently, just in a few minutes ago. Uh, if you're supporting your own infrastructure, it greatly reduces your manpower and your overhead and, and the I guess the burden that puts on your IT staff in order to continue to maintain that on-prem infrastructure, and that's HVAC, power, network, infrastructure, you know, storage, all those things fall under U.S. Signals umbrella, and we take care of all of it for you. Excellent. Uh, got another customer question coming in. How do you determine if your provider's data centers are located across national power grids? Is there an easy way to figure that out, or is that something that you just ask them directly, whether they are or not? That's a, the reason that's a good question is um, it's, it can be difficult to find and that's by design. Uh, the power grid is a target for international bad actors. Um, so as you know, with all the things going on with various different countries, uh, there is a, there's an ongoing target on certain types of, uh, of United States infrastructure and the power grid being probably the number one target. Um, so for that reason, they don't like to advertise exactly where different power breaks are, how that stuff is shared. There are things you can find with general information uh, about where these grids uh, break off, where some of the uh, separations by design are. So in other words, if you have a rolling outage, where it'll stop because they don't want it to continue. Um, the way power sharing works in a national power grid is they do on a regular basis, they will share power back and forth, you know, east, west, north, south, uh, between different power companies on that overall grid. A great example of this, uh, I can't remember what year it was, Jerry, you might remember, <clears throat> there was a significant power outage that it started in New York. This has got to be, what, 30 years ago or something. Um, but it started over in New York, and it started to roll to the west. And where it came to a screeching halt was Lansing, Michigan, <laughs> because it was halfway across Michigan, and it hit that national power grid separation, which is a kind of a safety gap. They're there for a reason, where it won't continue to try to borrow power from its neighbors, which it within the power grid is supposed to do. If you have a, you know, a particular power supply issue in one area, it'll start borrowing power from its neighbors, which is by design. Um, but you want to limit that because otherwise a major issue in some place like New York, it'll continue to borrow and work its way west until it just takes out the whole country eventually. But then they'll have that gap. And that gap happened uh, very abruptly in Lansing, Michigan. So Detroit was affected, but Grand Rapids was one not. Because if you do the Michigan map thing, it kind of runs right down the middle. Um, and so that worked as it was designed to work. So those details can be a little more difficult to find, again, by nature. This is by you know, our government kind of protecting some of that information. But there are some power grid details out there you can dig around and find. Uh, the one that we are obviously most experienced with is the one that splits off kind of our West Michigan, Chicago, uh, Indianapolis. Those data centers are on the west side. And then our, you know, our Detroit and the, the data centers on the east side um, are really split between that grid. So it makes a it really makes a good story because we're not that far from a fiber and latency perspective, um, but we're very far apart from a power perspective in that we we have safety in that separation. Right, right. Your, your power is air gapped. I like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so going on to the, the question of fiber, how do we distinguish um, what you guys do in terms of your fiber network that connect your many data centers with what some of the uh, you know, big three are doing? How are they connecting their data centers and how does that differ from what you guys are doing with the fiber? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually drastically different. So in a nutshell, U.S. Signal, we own all the connection. Uh, we manage it all. We have you know the trucks and the crews and the fiber repair people and uh, the monitoring and everything else in place. It's a DWM, DWDM, so dense wave uh, division multiplexing for fancy terms, but that's a, a cool way to send different wavelengths over fibers and multiple hundred gig waves. We manage all of that on our own equipment, our own fiber. Uh, the big three basically just buy access from people like US Signal. Uh, and many, many, many others. So we started out as a carrier's carrier 21 years ago uh, before cloud was even a thing. Uh, and we did large backbone network connectivity for, I mean, our customers were, you know, Sprint, AT&T and Cogent and Paytech and um, you know, a lot of these other folks. This is again, before AWS and, and Google was doing cloud hosting, um, but they needed that connectivity between their data centers as they started building them. And so they buy it from network providers and they rely on those network providers to provide that connectivity. Now, 
that also doesn't come for free. When you want to start sending traffic between, and again, this differs by the type of service that you're doing with AWS or Google or Azure, um, but that private connectivity, if you want to have dedicated private connectivity between them, that, that's not free. It's going to cost you some money. Uh, whether you buy it from somebody else, there are some cloud marketplaces that specialize in things just like that. Like, hey, how do I connect to this particular private cloud? I'm sorry, the public cloud provider in you know Ashburn is a big center uh, for AWS and some other folks. And there's places like Megaport and uh, and some other guys that do dedicated connectivity to these places, but they, they cost money. And it's a third party, sometimes even fourth party, depending on where that access is coming from. So big difference there is um, it's not free with the publics, uh, with the large, you know, the giga providers, uh, and they simply just purchase it from someone else to be able to connect their data centers and then rely on them to fix it, you know, send out trouble tickets if they have any network connectivity issues. With US Signal, everything is on that data centers and network. Mm -hmm. I have a customer question here about security. And for me, this was kind of a big one because we've taken on several customers where their uh, data center provider, their MSP themselves got ransomed and that they suffered because someone else uh, brought in a virus or what have you, and it ransomed the entire ecosystem. So customer's question has to do, you mentioned edge security. What does US Signal do in terms of edge security of their network? Yeah, we have, uh, and there's multiple facets to that. So security, if you're familiar with security practices, they come in layers. So we have many, many layers uh, from a, a single tenant perspective. So an end customer who has an environment US signal, um, we typically roll out a Palo Alto edge security device. We call it cloud-based advanced security or CBAS, a delicious fish, uh, but also our uh, Palo Alto security firewall. Uh, and that really just is based on size, how much bandwidth throughput capability you need. Uh, we do highly encourage that the IDS IPS uh, capability, so that intrusion detection and prevention is enabled on those Palo Altos. They can also be configured as a complete zero trust uh, security edge as well. Uh, so zero trust, next gen, um, IDS IPS, all those things rolled in. That gives a, a very robust kind of world-class Palo Alto edge security, single tenant, virtual, highly available, uh, for that particular solution. So that one end customer solution. Uh, so that's how we do it for individual uh, customer environments. But in addition to that, we have many layers of edge security and even internal uh, border security and regional security that we set up, leveraging a lot of additional Palo Altos actually, but also a very robust uh, MDR managed XDR. Um, we have our security operations desk and our uh, chief inf information security officer they have a whole map, a whole 24-7, 365 monitoring uh, team that looks at our backbone. So we're watching our public IP backbone. They can see fluctuations and trending changes, uh, looking for things like denial of service attacks, things like that. Uh, we also have our MDR. We have things like Sentinel-1 and Rapid-7 deployed, looking for any malicious code, anything. Uh, there's, there, these are AI-driven analytics that are pulling information from all these different network nodes and cloud nodes and compute environments, uh, looking to correlate that information together and say, hey, I see an anomaly. Something's, something's doing something different than it usually does. And that flags our security operations desk, uh, and then they can react to that. There's also with, uh, with our MDRs platforms and uh, those real-time monitoring systems, they get zero-day uh, activity updates constantly from around the world. So these are the Sentinel-1-based systems and things like that that are learning from each other all the time and then using that same kind of AI-driven analytics and decision-making to say, I see a piece of code coming in that looks, even though it hasn't even been executed yet, it came in as an attachment on an email or somebody downloaded or whatever, and I can see it in the environment, I, I think that's not good. It'll immediately quarantine that. It'll pull it out, set it aside and say, okay, that's, you know, I, somebody needs to know about this and then they will, our SOC team will be notified. Um, but those services are available for end customers as well. So we, you know, we've turned those uh, public facing now to where we've been doing them internally forever. So those are a lot of the security mechanisms we have in place at the backbone level for looking at US signal corporate basically. Uh, but we have all those type of services available for our end customers with the same level of support that we've been kind of giving ourselves for many years, uh, all the way to our security operations center, uh, monitoring those systems for our end customers. So uh, I know that's kind of a long-winded way to say that we have a lot of border edge and uh, single tenant customer security pieces. A lot of it's Palo Alto centered, but a lot of other systems monitoring and basically doing the checks and balances on that to make sure that nothing gets in. 
All that being said, there is also the disaster recovery, the reactive piece of that mm -hmm. to where if that customer ever did get anything in, we have a way to recover them very quickly with real-time replication, bring those workloads up in an isolated environment, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, U.S. Signal has extensive measures to uh, provide edge and border security between our markets, but also from the outside world uh, and, and customer environments. Well, very good. Well, it looks like we are getting close to the end of the hour. Um, so I guess I, I would close with one final uh, thought or question for you. Um, and I know U.S. Signal has some links that we'll be sharing with our attendees in terms of next steps. Tell me, if you were a customer looking at some next steps, what would be some of the things that you would be looking to do coming out of this? Uh, for me, uh, I would say the, the initial takeaway would be identifying the workloads that you have, what those critical workloads are, and start putting a, a basic idea together like, okay, these are the systems that we maybe want to move to a highly resilient production cloud hosting environment. These are the workloads that we need to have protected with something that's real-time replication or critical. These other workloads could maybe be lower priority, uh, you know, backup only. We can you know, get them back in a little while. And then once you have a good idea of, of that's going to be the kind of your scale, uh, what you want to protect. Uh, there's even some matrices you can go out there to, to say, okay, how long can this be down? Um, but that being said, you don't have to do all of that on your own. Um, if you need help designing that, that's exactly what I am for and our whole team of solution architects is to help you figure that out. Uh, we've got some tools you can run in like VMware environments or just get a server assessment. Jerry and Estes has tools that we've developed together to kind of get that assessment of what your environment looks like and then start getting an idea of what what are your goals to be uh, recovered in? What are your resiliency goals? What does your IT current staff look like? What are you supporting? And, and really, where do you want to go in the future? So not only your current state, but what your future state is. So I guess as a takeaway from this, I would start uh, internally, if I was an end customer, I would start internally evaluating what are our future state goals? Where do we think we want to go? And if we need help uh, even just determining that, then that's a great time to make a phone call to somebody that you know, maybe a trusted advisor, uh, somebody like Estes, like, you know, U.S. Signal, we're happy to partner with Estes anytime they have any questions on an end customer environment uh, to help start figuring some of that stuff out. If you've already got that kind of mindset and you're ready to start really getting into the, uh, the, the details of what it would like to move to a cloud hosting environment to get into more uh, data center infrastructure as a service, uh, disaster recovery, that kind of thing then that's really, it's a phone call to Estes. You can make that call, get started, start an evaluation, uh, get an idea of, of it, you know, if it's in the ballpark of what you're expecting. Chances are, what we typically strive for is in the grand scheme of things, uh, the, the total cost of ownership analysis, we would like, and our goal typically is successfully saving you money. When it comes into the grand scheme of hosting your own infrastructure and power and network and time and what we call FTEs and all that other stuff, um, we take a lot of that off your plate, make it reliable, make it easy to access, make it high performant, uh, and take a lot of those really heavy lifts off your plate for you. So a phone call, <laughs> get the conversation started. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest takeaways. We're happy to talk about whatever we need to to, to help satisfy and, and, and solve the problems that you guys are having. Very good. Well, to our uh, attendees today, thank you so much for coming on board and, and talking with us about uh, these matters. We will be sending a follow-up with uh, some links to some planning and cloud readiness assessment documents. If you're kind of curious to see and where you stand and, and uh, where you stand and how you might approach the rest of your journey, you can go through those. So we'll get those out to you as a follow-up here. And uh, thank you to uh, Chris and, and uh, Bruce for your time here today, or Jerry, I'm sorry. And uh, appreciate everything. You guys all have yourself a very fine day.